So you now have this mapping between all of the set of functions that could all encode the same, all of the set of sequences that can all encode the same function. What evolutionary signatures does is that it basically looks at the shape of that distribution of sequences that all encode the same thing. And based on that shape, you can basically say, ooh, proteins have a very different shape than RNA structures, yeah. than regulatory motifs, et cetera. So just by scanning a sequence, ignoring the sequence, and just looking at the patterns of change, I'm like, wow, this thing is evolving like a protein, and that thing is evolving like a motif, and that thing is evolving. So that's exactly what we just did for COVID. So our paper that we posted in BioArchive about coronavirus basically took this concept of evolutionary signatures and applied it on the SARS-CoV-2 genome that is responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and comparing it to- uh, To 44 cervicovirus species. So this is the what, beta. Uh, what, 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 what word did you just use? Cervic <laughs> Cervicovirus. So SARS-related oh, uh-huh. beta coronavirus. It's a portmanteau. So that whole family of viruses. Yeah. How so big is that family, by the way? We have 44 species that- or 44 I mean, species in the family? Yeah. Virus is a clever but, bunch. No, no, but but there's just 44, and again, we don't call them species in, in viruses, we call them strains, but anyway, there's 44 strains, yeah. and that's a tiny little subset of, you know, maybe another 50 strains that are just far too distantly related. Most of those only infect bats uh, as the host, and a subset of only four or five have ever infected humans. And we basically took all of those and we aligned them in the same exact way that we've aligned mammals. And then we looked at what proteins are, you know, which of the currently hypothesized genes for the coronavirus genome are in fact evolving like proteins and which ones are not. And what we found is that ORF10, the last little open reading frame, the last little gene in the genome is bogus. That's not a protein at all. What is it? It's an RNA structure. That doesn't have a, a... It doesn't get translated into amino acids. And that so it's important to narrow down to basically discover what's useful and what's not. Exactly. Basically, what are what is even the set of genes? The other thing that these evolutionary signatures showed is that within ORF3A lies a tiny little additional gene encoded within the other gene. So you can translate a DNA sequence in three different reading frames. If you start in the first one, it's you know A, T, G, et cetera. If you start on the second one, it's T, G, C, et cetera. And with, there's, a, there's a gene within a gene. So there's a whole other protein that we didn't know about that might be super important. So we don't even know the building blocks of SARS-CoV-2. So if we want to understand coronavirus biology and eventually fight it successfully, we need to even have the set of genes and, and these evolutionary signatures that I developed in my PhD work. Are you really we just here? recently used? You know what? Let's uh, let's run with that tangent for a little bit, if it's, <laughs> if it's okay. Uh, is uh, can we talk about uh, the the COVID nineteen a little bit more? Like, how? What's your sense about the the genome, the proteins, the functions that we understand about COVID nineteen? Where do we stand in in your sense? What are the big open problems? And and also. You know, you you kind of said it's important to understand what are the, like the the diff, the important proteins and like w- why is that important. <laughs> so, what else does the comparison of these species tell us? What it tells us is how fast are things evolving. It tells us about at what level is the acceleration or deceleration pedal set for every one of these proteins. So the genome has, you know, 30 some genes. Some genes evolve super, super fast. Others evolve super, super slow. If you look at the polymerase gene that basically replicates the genome, that's a super slow evolving one. If you look at the nucleocapsid protein, that's also super uh, slow evolving. If you look at the spike one protein, this is the part of the spike protein that actually touches the ACE2 receptor and then enables the virus to attach to your cells. That's the thing that gives it that that visual. Yeah, the corona look, basically. The corona look, yeah. yeah. So basically the spike protein sticks out of the virus and there's a first part of the protein, S1, which basically attaches to the ACE2 receptor. And then S2 is the latch that sort of pushes and channels the fusion of the membranes and then the incorporation of the um, viral uh, RNA inside our cells, which then gets translated into all of these 30 proteins. So the S1 protein 
is evolving ridiculously fast. So if you look at the stop versus gas pedal, the gas pedal is all the way down. ORF 8 is also evolving super fast, and ORF 6 is evolving super fast. We have no idea what they do. We have some idea, but nowhere near what S1 is. So what the- Isn't that terrifying that S1 is evolving? That means that's a really useful function. And if it's evol evolving fast, doesn't that mean new strains can be created or it does something? That means that it's searching for how to match, how to best match the host. So basically anything in, in general, in evolution, if you look at genomes, anything that's contacting the environment is evolving much faster than anything that's internal. And the reason is that the environment changes. So if you look at um, the evolution of these herbicoviruses, the S1 protein has evolved very rapidly because it's attaching to different hosts each time. We think of them as bats, but there's thousands of species of bats. And to go from one species of bat to another species of bat, you have, you have to, to adjust S1 to the new ACE2 receptor that you're gonna be facing in that new species.